you know, to a certain point we have the same existence, right? And at what point you know, I go off to Czechoslovakia and he goes to welding school, you know, and stays local. And obviously we become different people. But um, it, as it pertains to like identity and how, you know, we each become kind of like this interesting, unique series of intersections. So I, I mentioned, you know, I came from, a family, I come from a family of 13. My parents had kids <coughs> literally from 1957 to 1977. And for the most part, every other year, right? I was born in 74. The other thing I realized that, that distinguishes me is when you're born and you have that many older brothers and sisters, it kind of sustains a different kind of memory. So pop culture for me is not Sesame Street. It's Carlos Santana and, and, George, George, uh, and George Clinton and, you know, Bootsy Collins and, and Jimi Hendrix, right? So it, it interestingly kind of insists that you have like an older soul. So my connection to the 70s, although I was born in 74, like I can remember like watching my, my brothers get up, get ready to go out to the club, you know, so they all put on their my mom's shirts, <laughs> put on belts and you know, platform shoes. <coughs> but, uh, you know, and the other interesting thing that was had a, a really big impact on me is uh, my aunt did something really radical. She's still around. She's born in 28, so she's in her 90s. And um, sadly, in the 60s, her husband died in a construction accident. And, you know, for a widow with two kids, she did something really radical. This is, she took the money and moved to Egypt. She, she took her sons and moved to Cairo for 10 years. And when she came back, it just had this huge impact on our family. The, the, you know, what she brought, the recipes alone, of what she brought back from living in Cairo for 10 years, you know, changed the landscape of our family. Of course, her extended family because she remarried and then from Egypt. So all these connections to uh, you know to this other place. And, and, and I always say that between uh, you know between Hummus and Carlos Santana, between Bubba Ganesh and George Clinton, you know all of these interesting influences you know found a way in, into my work. Uh, you know the, the jewelry, the clothing, but also like again, I don't know how many of you know George Clinton's uh, album covers, but they're they're, they're interestingly related to a, a growing term now called Afrofuturism, which is kind of like science fiction-y, African, but it's, it's, it's in short, it might be just called Far Out, you know, but it's, it's definitely something for a six-year-old to take in, you know, so looking through those album covers, they should have been censored. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So you talked about how your pieces inform each other in the way that you're sort of recycling broken pieces, you know, source materials. Is sustainability an important part of your practice overall? Somebody wrote something about my work not long ago, and they kind of mentioned like the whole like Donna ready-made ideas, and I'm not sure if that's reaching too much, but I, I use the term information. And I think that in some cases, there's already enough information. So there's a piece on the stairwell, um, Sleeping Giant, and the center of that piece, so the outside is kind of similar to one of these. It's kind of like a, we call it a halo. It's actually cast from a flotation device. But uh, the center piece was made in 1993. And um, I'm glad you brought this up, as I mentioned, like reclaiming. You know, I'm 45. For 30 years, I, uh, I've been striving to be a professional ceramic artist. Like I wanted to do this since I was in ninth grade. This is what I want to be when I grow up. So I have this history, and it's not just my own history and the objects I left behind, some stronger than others, but it's also the history of people I connected with over those 30 years, and, and their works of art and, and their aesthetic interests. So very often, I, I, um, there's a research methodology we call autoethnography. Like I will literally go on a, a, a mission. And like I, before I came here, I was in my, I was under the uh, the deck in my mom and dad's house looking for stuff. <laughs> you 
You know, it might have been something that broke. It might have been, my, my brother would, would use a lot of things in our garden, like he would just sprinkle shards. And, and it's so interesting, too, that I, I later learned that there is a precedent for doing that in African folklore. So uh, porcelain specifically, glass, reflective objects, uh, using old hubcaps, like in, um, in kind of, uh, I, don't, I don't know what culture I'll call it because it's really an amalgamation of cultures. So, but in the islands, and some people might say it's voodoo, voodoo, but specifically in um, South Carolina, in the Gullah Islands, it's not unusual for graves to be decorated. So interestingly, I'm seeing these connections and, and connecting with these connections, but I, I will find pieces, um, and I think I even have a piece, a couple of pieces here. So the one I mentioned in the three is, is the oldest one. I, mean, I made that slipper rock as an undergrad, yeah. and it's now, one of them is at the Carnegie Museum now, and one of them is here. But I'm excited about the idea that I can find something in my mother's attic that was kind of unrealized. And it literally goes from margin to center, you know, over 25 years, you know. And same thing for these. Like these pieces were part of other pieces that were later glazed. And I mentioned like using glaze as a tool and not as a finishing product. And later glazed into. So in this case, this is literally a, a face that I think is at least 10 years old that I found and, and kind of married it into this pinch pot form. That, so this is kind of the old and new combined. So does it reference uh, you know, sustainability? I mean, to me, it's, it's kind of like not reinventing the wheel. Like a lot of these things, if I, if I find them, like a, so I have a cousin who owns a lot of property. And in 1998, I was kind of squatting on his properties. And there's a ton of stuff there. He's so busy that I cannot catch up to him. It's like, I want to spend time in that space. It's like a bunch of stuff rascals in there. And it's just, to me, those are resources. Some of the things I want to preserve and build as they are, I know there are tons of things that are probably going to become new works of art. So things, it's going to save me a lot of labor. So, <laughs> As far as, uh, as sustaining and recycling, it's probably saving my back as much as anything. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, everybody.